Good afternoon and welcome to today's Parliament webinar with John Raymer. How are we connecting everyone with compassion? More importantly, uh, thank you for being with us. My name is Molly Horn and I will moderate today's session. My work with the Parliament is in communications and coordinating our Fates Against Hate efforts. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'd like to start by just saying how proud we are to call John Raymer a friend of the Parliament. Uh, today is his second time delivering a presentation on the Compassion Movement for us, and now the timing couldn't be more right. Uh, Passover begins today, as many of us know. I'd like to say happy Passover to John. Um, uh, we are even more right now aware of our ties in our faith communities, uh, but even more than that, our shared humanity. Uh, at present, we are connecting with the communities of Overland Park, Kansas, and the surrounding Kansas City interfaith community uh, because it's imper imperative to recognize the critical role of interfaith advocates right now uh, to increase compassion in our local settings and lead the paradigm shift overall. Uh, we will learn more momentarily on that from John. But we need not wait, await the next tragedy to bring our communities together uh, to try and spare this kind of pain and suffering. Um, so I'd like to say we at the Parliament dedicate this time we are together today in love and community and prayer for those we lost yesterday at the hands of a very well-organized hate. Um, it is our time now to organize with love, with compassion, and with the best of our beliefs. Um, so let me tell you now a little bit about our incredible innovator, John Raymer. Uh, John Raymer is an American entrepreneur, a civic leader, an inventor, a musician, and the designer and the co-founder of the Compassionate Action Network International, a 501c3 organization based in Seattle. Um, they led the effort to make the city the first in the world to affirm Karen Armstrong's Charter for Compassion. Most recently, John conceived of and produced the Compassion Games, Survival of the Kindest, in response to a challenge from the mayor of Louisville to other cities to outdo Louisville's compassionate action as measured by hours of community service. Raymer also serves as Director and Chief Technology Officer at Four Worlds International Institute with a focus on the campaign to protect the sacred. The campaign birthed the International Treaty to Protect the Sacred from Tar Sands projects signed by over 50 different tribes throughout North America. Raymer is also the songwriter and lead guitarist in the band Once and For All. Now that's John's bio as of a year ago, and he's been quite busy in the last year doing a lot more amazing work. Um, so I'm going to turn you over to John and say, welcome, John. Thank you, Molly. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to make John um, today an organizer, so we're going to be able to see his screen, and um, he's got a presentation for us, a, a nice Prezi that we're all looking forward to looking at. And by the way, if you have questions along uh, the time that John is presenting, um, please do uh, share them with us. So John's going to share his screen. Yeah. Thank you so much for that thoughtful introduction to Molly. This is, you know, the urgency of this work that we're all doing is so obvious every day in different ways. And here we are one more time, you know, saying how can we awaken and remember and just something as simple as the golden rule. Something as simple as how we treat others and how we expect to be treated ourselves. So I'm very grateful to the Parliament for all the great work you've done for so many years, and you, Molly, for the leadership there and for the invitation to talk again about this journey we're all on together. As I say here in this first slide, I'm assuming you can see my screen that says from the golden rule to the golden reality. Yep, we can all see it. I hope that, good, good, that. One day we won't have to remember a rule. It'll just become the way we are. So that's the goal. And I'm going to say a little bit about my own story in regards to this, but it's not just the story of myself. It's the story of us, and it's the story of now. And those stories are always defined by challenges and choices and outcomes. In my personal case, the presentation here began for me having grown up in New York City, now living in Seattle for 25 years, but it was 9-11. And it was the challenges that that presented and the need for me to say, wait a minute. And again, it's unfortunate that these things have to happen close to home. 
for us to realize the challenges we're facing. But that's my story, and it became imperative for me to get engaged in the community and understand the roots of the hate, the organized hate like you're talking about, and why can't we really just live together, as Rodney King said, right? Why can't we all just get along? So anyway, many years of organizing in Seattle uh, for myself and getting a tuned to how we connect through our similarity and that we innovate through our diversity and get to know people that are different than myself. In fact, being Jewish, I became more Jewish when I got involved in interfaith work because I found myself surrounded by people who didn't know about Judaism and wanted to know about it. And uh, there were surprising joys of getting involved in the community. And for me, that culminated in 2008 in Seattle when we had an event called The Seeds of Compassion. I'm going to walk through some of these slides quickly so we can also have some time of any questions. But that event was a turning event for us, and that was the same year that Karen Armstrong won the TED Prize. And that was a turning point, I think, for all of us, in that all of a sudden something as cool as TED Talks focused on compassion and brought attention there. And the Compassionate Action Network and many other sprouts came out of the seeds of compassion. And that's when I also had the good fortune to meet hereditary chief Phil Lane and get involved in the work with the tribes, living in a city like Seattle, which is named after a Duwamish chief, and taking seriously the idea of compassion. This is a subject that is really a painful part of our history, is the relationships with the tribes. And in fact, the irony in all this now that the environmental movement has realized that the indigenous people have so much to contribute and teach us about how you preserve and protect Mother Earth. So anyway, Phil and I got involved in thinking about how the ancient wisdom, 40 years of consultation led to this beautiful summary statement called starting, starting from within, working in a circle, in a sacred manner. We develop and heal ourselves, our relationships in the world. And I had a technical background, and Phil had never used a computer. He now has over 75,000 people who follow his walking the red road. But we began to look about how we can marry the technological amazing capabilities of our time, the way we're connected this way, and bringing this ancient wisdom, these kind of natural order principles. And there are 16 guiding principles that we laid out in that paper that talks about how this, in effect, could be a community operating system. I encourage anyone to look there. It's been key to our work all this time. Well, seeing the charter getting, uh, you know, the attention that it was, and when it was unveiled in 2009, we decided to focus here in our own community and have it become the basis of a 10-year campaign and went to our city council and to our mayor and said, if we can get 1,000 people to pledge their time, talent, and treasure to help others meet their basic human needs, would you be the first city to affirm the charter? It happened. They did. And that led to a beautiful city proclamation based upon the idea of the charter and the idea then we baked into this 10-year campaign the idea that every April we plant seeds and every October we harvest and to bring attention to compassion all year round. But Karen Armstrong heard about this. She came to Seattle for this kickoff event in April of 2010 that start the 10-year campaign. And then the challenges faced, we faced was, OK, now what? I mean, it's a beautiful idea to affirm the charter. It says everything. It's an aspirational goal. But how do we really make that real? In fact, we just hosted a conference here in Seattle inspired by Karin's answer to that question, she says that a compassionate city is an uncomfortable city. So if we are really taking this seriously, you realize it's a big challenge. And what I love about the games is that it's a way to do some of the heavy lifting with a light heart. But for us, the question of how we go about turning our city into a compassionate city began first off by mapping what was already working in our community and realizing that there's a ton of things happening in our community that are focused on alleviating the pain and suffering of others. And the last thing we wanted to do was to show up as if we knew better than anybody else. So the honorable thing to do is start with what's already working, build that asset-based approach. And that's what we did. And we also uncovered this idea written about first in the Stanford Social Innovation Review Journal of 
collective impact. And that really resonated with us as well because we knew that the city government couldn't turn us into a compassionate city, the faith-based groups couldn't do it, the businesses couldn't do it, it would take everyone together. And they have a beautiful, simple set of conditions necessary to create collective impact. And those are laid out here, shared vision, a shared measurement system. This is a big issue for a lot of people. How are you going to know you're making progress? How are you going to measure something like compassion? Mutually reinforcing activities amongst the people involved, some continuous communications to keep everyone connected, and building a backbone, a supportive platform to make that happen. So that was a very powerful idea for us, but once again, okay, how are we going to make that happen? And during this period of time, things evolved. And the next step for us was reaching out to other cities. When we launched that 10-year campaign, we were stunned to find out that there were many other cities around the world that are interested in doing the same thing. And I'm happy to tell you now, there's over 200 cities around the world that have started a Compassionate City campaign. And the whole Charter for Compassion, for that matter, is now its own separate 501c3. We were given, we at the Compassionate Action Network, the Charter for Compassion and Work Stewards, and it's now just a natural evolution that it's become its own standalone entity working in partnership with the Compassionate Action Network, the Compassionate Cities Campaign, with the Compassion Games, and there's hundreds of cities and hundreds of partners that are involved in the, uh, in the work here with the Charter. In fact, they've got not only just cities, but there's different partners with educators and religious and spiritual communities and businesses and healthcare and environment. And it's a thriving movement. I think we all should be really proud of what's coming together here. Now, the collective impact idea, back to that, this one city was particularly amazing was Louisville, Kentucky. And they continue to be leaders in this space and have for many, many years. And they have this incredible mayor, Mayor Greg Fisher who had the real courage and insight and wisdom. And he's a business guy, so in some ways he says this made it easier for him because he was really drafted to be the mayor. But he ran on not only lifelong, lifelong learning and health, and health not just physical health, but spiritual health as well, but also compassion. And he won, and he's beloved by the city and is a real leader in this movement. And sure enough, after we, the Compassion Action Network, gave them a, an award, the mayor sent a letter through Tom Williams to me saying that they were the most compassionate city in the world. And what was so interesting for me, once again, this challenge of collective impact, all of a sudden, the idea for us of the Compassion Games gave us a way to address some of those key conditions necessary. Not only a shared vision, but we could come up with a simple measurement system. And for us, what we measure is the number of volunteers, the hours of service, the number of people that are served, and the dollars that are raised to support local causes. So we said game on in response to the mayor's challenge. And in the first year, we played for 30 days. And again, we realized it's kind of edgy, this idea of competing for compassion. But this isn't competition as we know it. We're re reframing that idea, going back to its origins, which the root competere means to strive together. So this isn't about holding others down, it's about raising everybody up. In fact, the word we use is a co-opetition. So we're cooperating to compete, not against, but with each other. And we're cooperating to see, in fact, the indigenous people had a practice out here in the Pacific Northwest of the potlatch, which is a competition in giving. And as well, the Northern Plains have this giveaways, which is a similar idea to strengthen the will to give either through service projects or individual acts of kindness. And we came up with all sorts of creative games in that first year. And then sure enough, a whole bunch of other communities wanted to participate with us again last year. So last year I'd called the first year of the modern compassion games. We made it 11 days, taking place from September 11th through the 21st. And there were 19 cities um, and in Sweden and in India, and the United States, and now this year there's many more already signing up. But the basic idea was, okay, you either commit to be a player or an organizer of the games. We set uh, together a whole program called the Secret Agents of Compassion that people could sign up and receive missions throughout the games. 
that they can do individually random acts, they can organize service projects, and we built a compassion map, which is interesting. It's built on an open source platform called Ushahidi, which is Swahili for testimony, and it's for crisis mapping. It was used and is used against violence, against women, a number of different other challenges. It's a place to let a community see what's going on. And we thought, what a perfect way to let them see the compassion happening in their community. So the compassion map is a, is a place that people report. And then how do we celebrate together? And this is what that map looks like. And there were over 1,400 reports last year put onto the map with these 19 communities, 33,700 volunteers, 126,000 hours of service, 97,000 people served, raised almost half a million dollars. Like I said, over, it says 1,200, but over 1,400 reports, and coming from 28 different countries. And again, the challenge and opportunity here is to develop our ability to learn new skills and to do things we haven't done before. And that's our goal in the Compassion Games, is to strengthen what's already working in communities and to encourage us to get out of our comfort zones and move into our stretch zones. And here's a beautiful example of that. Shana Lester, and written about by Leah Mandelbaum, folks from California with the leadership, Sandy Hart, they're in all of Compassion California. They brought the games to a, the California Institute for Women. And it's just a beautiful example of where Compassion can come in and make a difference. In that case, a woman known as Evil changed her name to Tinkerbell. And what's remarkable, 11 days without a single incident of violence. And it was a great gift to all of us for this kind of innovation to happen. And this year, we've got lots of great new things planned. I mean, there were many, many other stories, and they're all on the map for folks to read. But because of the interest in the games, we realized we should break them out into leagues. So this year, there's going to be schools and education, and tribes and interfaith and healthcare, as well as cities. So we're going to make it easier for folks to organize within their own communities of practice or communities of interest and challenge each other in the spirit of competitive altruism, the co-opetition. Also, Lisa Walker, amazing doctor from Austin came to us through the charter and has an idea for the Compassion Relays, which we just have totally embraced, which is a brilliant idea. So the games take place between September 11th through the 21st. But we want to all train for the games, and we want to herald the upcoming games. So the idea is there's a compassion torch, and you can commit to carry that torch for a week. And in doing so, take note of how compassion shows up in your world. The three dimensions that are used are compassion for others, compassion for the earth, and compassion for yourself. And then report on those incidents, those experiences, on the map as well as then passing the torch. And this has become a fabulous way to spread the word about the relays and the games and about compassion, inspiring, motivating, activating, and celebrating compassion. And what we want to do and what we've started is to identify leaders in the community. And I'm sure there are folks listening to this webinar that would be the perfect kind of folks that we'd want to highlight and identify them and the work that they're doing as high-profile torch carriers. So the idea is to find a way to support and strengthen what's already working out in the world around compassion, bring attention to it, put it out through our many channels for social media, and websites, etc to promote what's already working in the communities by using the torch and using the relays. And a great example is what's been happening in Atlanta. I know Molly, you and others were just there. Uh, remarkable events taking place in Atlanta as they become a compassionate city with the city council having signed on. And they're using the relays in a similar way where they're challenging each other in the community. And they took the relays, and we'd gladly do this for anyone who's listening, and they put together the front end with the torch and with the challenge for folks to connect everyone with compassion, but put their own messaging on the back and using it as a way to promote their local initiative. And we'd love to be able to do that and help anyone who's listening who wants to bring the games and the relays to their community and start a compassion campaign in some shape or form. So there's so much going on. 
we recently met with His Holiness when he was here in Silicon Valley in, um, just in February. And we're hoping that the event was going to be in 2015. We're really still not sure because we haven't been able to confirm the date. There's some challenges with uh, the Dalai Lama coming in September of 2015. But 2015 is his birthday. And Dr. James Doty from CARE and many, many others are collaborating and working together to bring forth this World Compassion Festival. I'm not sure when it's going to be, but we were wanting to tie it in with the games to strengthen what this movement is doing and use this the, uh, magnetic attractor to pull this all together. But there's so much going on. I mean, we have the U.S. Council of Mayors has a, come out with a proclamation in support of compassionate cities, and the list goes on. Like I said, you've got um, people all over the world that are affirming the charter, that are starting these campaigns, that are participating with the relays and the games, and um, I'm just really grateful to be a part of all this. I know that compassion has this magical way of transcending uh, typical understanding. In fact, David Bro, incredible man, has stood on a corner in Davis, California for I don't know how many years now, but has gotten thousands of answers to the question, what is compassion? And I think that's a beautiful way of dealing with compassion is that it's really an open question. And in any moment, every moment, like right now, how can compassion show itself to us and to those that we're with and to help inspire us and activate us to move from the golden rule to the golden reality? So with all those words and all those pictures, Molly, I think I should take a pause and let anybody, if they're interested, uh, or you, Molly, any questions you may have, well, uh, I, reflections upon the story. I just, I'm overwhelmed with uh, appreciation for the work that's been happening and um, I want to share with everyone um, that the Parliament actually about a week and a half ago um, yeah. developed a strategic partnership with the Charter for Compassion and uh, I'm thinking now, looking at our attendee list, I know so many of you are probably familiar with the charter, but um, I want to spend a moment just sharing it again um, to give it sort of the recognition it deserves to keep it central sort of to our, to our minds as we talk about this movement. So I'm going to quickly, um, I'm going to switch back uh, screens and make me presenter. It's going to take me a second here, so I appreciate uh, everyone's patience. Um. And thanks for doing that, Molly. When we were preparing, we, we do want people to be reminded about the words of the Charter. And also one of the brilliant things that the Charter for Compassion is doing is um, by putting it under a Creative Commons license, folks are able to create derivative works. There's a children's charter, and so the charter really is a living document and can be adapted to local communities so that the really essence of charter can become, of the essence of compassion, can become part of any charter needed to birth a campaign in your community. Hmm. Um, I'm just going to ask John, can you see my screen now? You know, I cannot, but that may be because I'm presenting. Hold on. Okay. So um, to our attendees, if you could just send me a message to let yes, us know. I can. I can. Oh, great, I can. great, great, great. Okay, so this is a photo that you're looking at right now of uh, Parliament Chair um, Imam Malik Mujahid uh, and Karen Armstrong uh, at the Compassionate Atlanta Festival on April 3rd, having just signed this declaration, uh, which is basically saying that we are going to mobilize um, our interfaith ambassadors here at the Parliament and from our position uh, as a global interfaith organization support the Compassionate Cities Movement and uh, um, in exchange uh, the Charter for Compassion is going to highlight the work of interfaith activists in promoting the Charter because I think they're just so in sync um, and our work is, is overlapping and should just be the collective impact I think that that this whole movement aims to accomplish. Um, so we're excited about this. Um, you can view this. You can view this statement on our website as well as this little video of the signing. 
Um, and that's Andrew Himes there applauding. He's the director of the Charter for Compassion. Um, so here we see the Charter for Compassion text, which was written by Karen Armstrong, um, in conjunction with a group of leaders um, from different faiths around the world. This wasn't a, an entirely uh, sole uh, enterprise. She really collaborated with um, leaders of many faiths to ensure that the text was respectful to their traditions. Uh, but she says, the principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there, and to honor the inviolable sanctity of every human being, treating everybody without exception with absolute justice, equity, and respect. Um, so the, the remaining text is here on this slide. It's going to be on the next slide as well. Um, I'm going to urge everyone to sign the charter, um, to read it privately, um, to think about it, and even consider sharing with us your views on it and feelings and how you think you could adopt this uh, in your own setting, um, in your life, and in your faith community. Um, and let's talk about it. Uh, this is, you know, calling to men and women and the, ur the urgency and the imperative nature of this work. Um, John, how many years ago have you signed this charter? Well, I signed it when it was first launched in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, the, at that time, you know, individual signing was one thing. Now having institutions and other groups and organizations being able to sign as well represents another step forward in how we can create this movement that we're all part of. Yeah, so with that in mind, I'm glad that you updated us about the uh, progress of the World Compassion Festival. We're so yes. excited about that. Um, I want to start our conversation and our questions. Uh, I, I'm happy to say we did get a couple of questions while you were presenting about how to see the presentation later because uh, we have people with us who are interested in starting a campaign in their own city. Um, yes. So we're going to send that out on YouTube, um, as well as it's going to be out in the Parliament newsletter, and you can probably friend John on Facebook. He'll have it uh, probably posted pretty soon. Uh, but we talk a lot about the practicality and this not being sort of a frou-frou thing. This is a real uh, change in the way that we operate our, our lives and our society. Um, what kind of measurable goals uh, does the World Compassion Festival think of uh, meeting when a network of compassionate cities begin to work together? John, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's that's a question well, yeah. for you. Yes, yeah. Well, and that's why the games and the relays, I think, are also helpful in this because so what's beautiful in Stanford, I first learned about this idea of elevation. So there are, you know, not only quantifiable, but there's qualitative measures here. And going to the Compassion game site and going to the Compassion map is the idea of elevating things that are working and making people aware of those is a very big piece of how we build and strengthen this movement. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of measurable goals, there's all sorts of interesting creative ways. I, uh, I learned recently, someone said, okay, you want to know the one best indicator of a healthy community and a thriving community? And I said, okay. And he said, well, it's the literacy of the women. So that's one simple measure, but obviously there's a whole world of indices that are being created. You know, the Gross National Happiness Movement has done a lot of work in this regard. With the Compassion Games, we're focusing on volunteers and service, the number of hours, the money raised for causes, the number of people that are served. The Relays is all about passing the torch and, you know, creating a movement in your community. I even think more important than the actual goals is the process of having a conversation in your community about what you're going to measure. Homelessness is an issue here. I know I'm sure it is in every community. There's so many ways that we can come at embracing what's already being done in our communities and, and measures that are already accepted and ways to use those as uh, signs and guideposts to us along the path. Now with the festival we know, just like we knew with the Seeds of Compassion, festivals are great. We want a day focusing on the different areas where people are working. There's going to be a beautiful ritual to kick it off and then a concert and everything. But it's just another milestone. We know it's the work after the festival that's really going to, ma uh, going to really matter. 
-hmm. So compassionate cities is one expression, but in all the different, if you look in the charter site, you'll see the different sectors, and that's why we're doing leagues this year, so we can break out into areas and we can innovate together and come to see what we need to measure and how we need to strengthen our, our will. You know, it's not just the way, it's the will and the way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I hope the games will inspire and challenge people to get creative and to think about ways to reach out to their community to get them to participate as well. We're all challenged by Louisville. They are fierce competitors. And I'll tell you this, um, they said they were so compassionate that they would come out to Seattle to help us beat them. <laughs> so if your community is up for the challenge, we really do want to get you involved. And Sandy Hart, who's just like a superstar in this whole space, is the head coach for the leagues and working with teams. So please do reach out to us if you want to get involved. We'd really love to be a part of working with you and your community. Well, I think actually Sandy's with us this morning, so I'd like to say oh, hello. So. Hello to Sandy. Um, affiliated, uh, she's the North American Chair for United Religions Initiative. Yes. Yes. Um, and I, I was happy to see on your league map that we're already set up to be in competition with URI this year <laughs> at the Parliament. That's really exciting. It's uh, so good. I mean, I can't imagine a better way of celebrating our connection, our interbeing with each other, than to challenge each other and to see um, what can we do in that space of reaching out to be more and more compassionate. Well. I think we're getting some questions now, which is fantastic. Um, they're being sent to me in text form, uh, so I just want to prepare everyone. I'm going to go through and just uh, give a shout out to you. Um, I see the most recent was from Jack Unra. If I can find you, Jack. Uh, Jack. Oh, it's a it's an acquaintance of yours. Uh, hi, Jack. Are you That's there? Amazing, Denver. Yep. Denver, are you with us? No. No. Jack's not with us. Not yet. <laughs> oh, I, maybe I am. He's you there. Are. It's seem that I am. I thought the sign said I was to, as a listener only. Yeah, well, I've surprised you and given you the floor. I, I like your question, <laughs> so why don't you share with ceiling, everyone? And the ceiling, Jack. You got both the floor yeah. and the ceiling. And yeah. I'd yeah, like to yeah. encourage... Yeah, I'd like to encourage everyone as well, um, beyond just asking questions, if you have experience uh, with the compassion organizing in your community, if you'd like to step up and share some of your experiences, we'd love to hear about them as well. So, Jack, I turn to you. Well, I'll just read the question. Uh, what advice uh, from anyone about uh, secular thinkers who object to the cachet of religion and the charter? and institutionally suspicious folks worrying about this being a quote-unquote movement. So, uh, and, uh, the reason I'm asking is that uh, occasionally these folks are important uh, to the campaigns uh, in, here in Denver, the, the campaign to get Denver uh, to recognize itself as a, as a compassionate city. And uh, so that's important, and of course, you would want these guys to just be at peace about these issues, which, to my mind, raise no actual cognitive dissonance, but that's in the mind of the beholder. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, that's why I mentioned it before, Jack, about the fact that the charter's under uh, a Creative Commons license, because you've got to be a culturally appropriate, and a charter for compassion can be written and it's again the process of it coming together that could be very very powerful there so as opposed to trying to persuade folks you know meet people where they're at has been always been my experience with this and start from there and you may be surprised uh, but you're right if you come in with a you know a doctrine and then trying to impose it it could people will you know resist and therefore, I think it takes a sensitivity and it takes compassion to, you know, find that common ground. And just that you asked that question, Jack, tells me that, you know, the, the campaign's in good hands there. Um, you know, we need to demonstrate what that means to live into it. For us, that became playing with compassion and love wins. And those ideas are very powerful and they're not so easy to understand always. So. You're on your way, and I think that um, 
you know, the idea of drafting a charter or amending the charter to suit the particular group that's convening, if that gets you more juice and more, um, you know, momentum, then have, have at it. I mean, for us, the four-way <laughs> partnership was the theory of change. It's bottom up, top down, outside in, but all starting from the inside out. Right. And those four directions, taking it, you know, an idea from somewhere else, showing them what's been done, but starting from within there and, what, and being what, the change. What's your feeling, John, about uh, the receptivity of uh, Charter for Compassion International uh, to, I mean, let me just first say you totally left the box on that one because it had never occurred to me to create a secular charter. But what do you think the Charter for Compassion International would think about uh, endorsement of such a thing? You may remember in the Miller's uh, resolution that there was an acknowledgement that the third largest uh, ethical disposition in the world after Christianity and Islam is secularism. Mm -hmm. um, and the Dalai Lama, as you know, been really focusing on secular ethics and this whole idea, because in some ways, religion has given God a bad name and has created, <laughs> you know, uh, all sorts of problems. With you know, I we need to honor that. In fact, the Charter recognizes that. But I know from firsthand experience of working with Andrew and working with the folks at the Charter that this is not that this is not out of the box. In fact, the box has to be defined this way to be inclusive and respectful. So there are adaptations of the charter. In the language of the Creative Commons license, it's called mm -hmm. a derivative work. So you share and share alike. For instance, I have friends who are very passionate about uh, vegetarianism. And there's ah. no reference to, in the charter, uh, it doesn't include all sentient beings. So I heard Karin say, go ahead, write one. And, and, and the Charter for Compassion has included those expressions on their site in that spirit of share and share alike. So this is good that it wasn't obvious. And I guess, you know, it takes calls like this and moments like this. So if anyone's listening and says, boy, I, I love the Charter, but I know that it may not work as it is where I am, that it's not against the rules to do a, an adaptation and derivative work of the Charter. And also, can I... You've made my breakthrough day, you guys. <laughs> oh, it's so great to hear, Jack. <laughs> and, and, and everyone, and Jack, I'd like to add, um, we had the chance to spend some time with Karen uh, in Atlanta, and one of my questions to her was, uh, what has been most surprising in this movement taking shape and, and having life? And she said the involvement and the enthusiasm of secular people, uh, because her work is so central about removing sort of the hijacked image of, yes. of religion, um, that it's exciting and rejuvenating to people who have been skeptical or disenfranchised by religion to come forth and see that people are really coming to the core of the golden rule, which is a universal principle, you know, in any kind of social ethic, religious or not. Awesome. So, thank you so much, Jack. Um, we have another question. It's a practical question. Uh, it comes from Darcia. Uh, or Darcia, hopefully she's still here. Um, Darcia, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, welcome. Darcia, would you like to ask your question uh, to John? Uh, yes, and I know I've had uh, some conversations with John already, but I've Hi, got, Darcia. Hi, John. I've got some people listening who um, I, I had um, the pleasure of understanding that they're going to be on the call. I hope they still are. Uh, for example, a CEO of one of our nursing homes, John Pichet. I hope he's on the line. And um, some other people that are working with me in our Peace Days Committee, Estelle mm -hmm. Andrew. And I'm wondering, practically speaking, how do we um, get going in terms of a platform? Like we've, just, we've been discussing internally whether we should use our Peace Days as our platform. Um, do you need to set up a separate website practically to kind of get going? Um, I, I'm pleased to see that you've got different leagues now coming into play. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. From that perspective, do you recommend getting someone from each category say, for example, an educator, uh, somebody who works with the health care system on the actual planning committee to get it started in your community? Yes, yes. And we have a playbook. So we're talking about the compassion games here. And 
there is a Compassion Games site, so your presence there and on that dashboard that you saw for the leagues, we can do that so you don't need a separate platform. And the idea is to really integrate and energize what's already working there. So in that playbook, we've laid out you know, forming an organizing committee, how to get involved with service agencies like we've talked about the United Way's involvement, mm -hmm. and how do you go out and build relationships with the media, and your, your Peace Days event, which is happening in uh, Manitoba, is connected to uh, the International Day of Peace, which is the last day of the Compassion Games. Yeah. So, you know, this whole vision is to strengthen what's already working there, and uh, you guys do not need a separate site. You can integrate, and we're in, going out of our way to make everything we have easy to plug in and, and make it uh, a resource that can add value to what you already have. Okay. But you would recommend on our planning committee getting some of the different people involved. Can you talk about the leagues and how you're doing that? Like, one of the things I wondered is we, we were intrigued by the Compassion Relays because we, we now have the ear of our Minister of Education, and we were hoping to maybe use something that's, it, it was nicely set up for schools already, the relay, mm -hmm. except I understand the relays are intended to be done before the games, but because it's already near the end of the school year and, you know, September is a very busy time for teachers, it, it, it's kind of nice to take that discrete package of the relays and, and, and say to schools, here, why don't you try this? Yeah, yeah, so the relays can be done any time of the year. And you can do them during the games as well. I mean, the whole idea is to bring attention and intention to compassion. So, yes, in fact, we've put together, thanks to Lisa Walker and other people, um, articulations of how the relays can be used in different areas, like the leagues, right, within business, within organizations, within interfaith groups. And um, you can then also do those during the games or leading up to the games. So the idea is to make it something that's um, easy to grab hold of and to use as a way to spread the word and hopefully build engagement and interest in the Compassion Games in September. Okay. Now, in fact, Leah Mandelbaum in Los Angeles used the Compassion Games model uh, in February, I think it was, or March, for two weeks. I mean, it's amazing. So the, we're very flexible about this. I mean, we're just trying to inspire and activate and celebrate compassionate action. And if you see a way you can use it, that's what Atlanta embraced the relays and other folks in other cities have in new and creative ways. That's the joy of this, guys. Everybody can take ownership here and, and, and make it work for you and show us what you did and we'll share it with other people too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Darcy, for all the good work you guys are doing. Thank you again, Darcia. Um, if there's any more questions, I do see uh, somebody named France Adams in the audience uh, said that there was a Radio Chronicle started on compassion. So I'd like to hear more about that. I'm sure John would as well. Uh, mm -hmm. France, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Why don't you share uh, your 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 program? Yeah. Well, I'm with Darcia, so. Um Darcy wanted to know if there was other people um, with her, and I, I'm definitely here. Um, not too long ago in March, I started a, um, a chronicle with the radio station. Like um, It's kind of like the national radio, in, but in French. But at that moment of the, um, the, the, the show that's happening between 6 and 9 o'clock in the morning is, is done uh, specifically in Manitoba and the, the, the west of Canada, basically. And um, so anyway, I proposed this chronicle on compassion. Uh, getting, I just thought that if we started the ball rolling in terms of compassion and having a, you know, get people to talk about it to each other. And what happened really is I started in March, so I've only done three chronicles so far. And within those three chronicles, um, we went through with, you know, what's the definition of compassion and then talking a little bit about that compassion is like uh, cultivating a garden. And, and um, now I'm into basically um, talking to different organizations, trying to get um, what's already happening in, in, in the city for us, especially in the French community, because like I said, the radio station is in French and there's lots and lots and lots of stuff happening already so to me the radio was a way of, of, of uh, you know it's a great platform to access to a lot of people and start the ball rolling in terms of compassion and I would love to bring this idea of the compassion games but through the radio so how can I start it um, I went on your um, website John and 
and um, to be honest, I, I was having a little, um, I, it's not clear yet to me how I can start uh, involving uh, the French community through the radio with this, um, with the game, so. Yeah, well that's a great opportunity. Thanks for being honest, okay? And I do want that kind of feedback because we want to make it easy. Well, one thing to do is the relays. So we could have, I know it's a radio, maybe we'll have the radio microphone be the picture of the high-profile torch carrier, or you, Francis, if you want. But your vision for Chronicles and your vision for the show. So we want to use every channel we can, the radio, the websites, Facebook, Twitter, you know, email, newsletters. The idea here is to cross-promote. And one of the ideas that we could take, I'm just thinking, is promote the work of the, of the show that you have and promote the idea of the games happening in Manitoba and support the overall Peace Days and other efforts you're doing there. And that's why we did the relays, to make it something easy for you to grab a hold of. So if you want to know more about it, if you look at the drop-down, today it is on the site, How to Play Compassion Relays. The relays, yeah. Yeah, and um, that might be an easy place to start, and more feedback on how to make the site easier to navigate. And we need it in French. That's the, you know. Yeah, that okay. would be easier for sure. I know, I know, yeah, I know. I know, I know. You're how, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as compassionate as I want to be. If I would be, I'd have it <laughs> in every language on earth. We'll get there. If anyone wants yeah, to help. Yeah, yeah no. Um, the, there was also what really, um, um, I guess I was, um, to me, what sounded fun also is the idea, and trying to, to locate it where you had it, but like this idea of um, the detective. Um, secret agents of compassion, sacred, yes. Yes, I love that idea. And that's in a way, like you're talking about relays, but I was, I was hooked on the, this idea of, uh, yeah. Yeah, of now we have agents. all the missions from last year, and right now, off in a secret location, Andy Smallman, who's a genius, who's been teaching kindness online, is working on this year's missions for the Secret Agents of Compassion. Okay. So, um, and we're really getting going. So anybody who wants to play and be a part of producing the games, not just locally, but globally with us, because we got interest in cities um, in Sweden, there'll be at least three cities, in India, in fact, Lisa's also talked to the schools, some of these organized schools in Pakistan. So the hope this year is to have, you know, 75 different teams engaged okay. and to have thousands and thousands of hours of service. Mm -hmm. All right. Hundreds well, of thousands. There's, um, I have a bank of at least, there's for sure 500 um, people that we have access to the radio. So if we wanted to start anything, we can have access to these people to start something. Very good. And you're telling me the sacred agent um, is, is not available at this time because he's... No, it is. It is. Oh, it is. Those, okay. those missions we did last year, but we're going to write okay. new ones for 2014. Oh, I see. Okay. But Welcome. you can use those now that are there, and we encourage that. And there's lots okay. of. Okay, so I, I just have to go on your site, on your uh -huh. website. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Look forward to our co-opetition. <laughs> see what Manitoba is up to. How compassionate exactly. are you guys? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, very cool. Uh, so, John, um, I've put another question up on the screen. It's actually two questions, uh, but one is, uh, what is the role of a compassion officer in a municipality, which I heard one of the compassionate cities has actually employed someone to do this. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about more about that. And then secondly, um, if we could talk about funding a little bit, because I know that's a question everyone has. Yep, yep. Okay, so I don't know what the role of a compassion officer in a municipality is. Like a, you know, it's not like a Wikipedia term yet, but this is what I can imagine. I mean, it's a policy issue. I mean, one of the, and it was Pam Kilborn Miller who shared with me the understanding that cities are a fabulous leverage point for change because in a municipality with a mayor, the mayor can help set the priorities and set a budget. And I think we all know that budgets are moral documents. That's the big question about who benefits, who pays, who decides, right? So I'm assuming that a compassion officer in a community would bring uh, this unfortunately often overlooked dimension to policy setting 
and to helping shape policies. Um, this is a real issue. It's happening in San Francisco. We watched the mayor of Louisville and the mayor of San Francisco talk, for instance, affordable housing. I mean, what issue really in a community isn't touched by compassion? So I'm assuming the compassion officer would probably work across the different departments in the community to bring some thought and bring awareness to how compassion could make a difference in the policies that are being set and the way those policies are being enforced. Um, like I said, we were thrilled that restorative justice, this whole idea is taking root as well, and the compassion games being played in the prisons uh, brings a whole different dimension. You know, the fear and the bullying and the tragic situations that we all find ourselves in, whether it's schools, I mean, we've kind of reached peak hierarchy. And as these institutions are going through these changes, compassion is so important. And so often people see with their workplace as, as a, you know, uh, an interruption from time off, a form of paid suffering. So a compassion officer in the municipality for me would report directly to the mayor, it would send a signal that compassion is important in the work of the departments and in the policy that's being set by the legislature. Well, that's a fantastic answer. I'm going to think about that in my future, actually. I love what you said about budgets being moral documents. Actually, I was wishing I could put it on Facebook right away. So that's going to be a quotable moment. <laughs> um, and then, and then the, that does tie into funding um, a compassion right, campaign. Right. Uh, because right. actually, is a key issue. It really is. You're right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say when we had um, Karen Armstrong's audience a couple of weeks ago, and we were able to speak. Um, one thing she was very, very clear on is that she really is not a big fan of compassion action costing a lot of money. It almost violates the concept of compassion to pour lots of money into these activities. So the idea being keep the cost low, not, not to be wasteful. Well, that's a good idea in general. I would totally agree yeah. that um, you know, we should keep the cost low. But the reality is, is that it takes resources to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to rethink uh, sacred economics is emerging. Um, we forget that we kind of made up the economic system as it is. And uh, you, know, you can't add more water. You can't add more air. You, know? you can add more money. And uh, we've proven that. So I think we need to rethink about this issue because it's true. There is a psychic income, if you will, that comes from doing this work, from you know, rethinking you know, values clarification about what is really enough. And I think it's true, is that I know the rewards I gain from being able to work on this are immeasurable. At the same time, if we had enough resources where people could dedicate more time, I think we could do a lot more good. And one of my goals with the Compassion Games and the Compassion Relays is to have these programs be sustainable and uh, to be able to identify institutions in our community that are working this way and let them gain the value of association with us because I do think we all need to be realistic about what it takes. And, um, you know, we're a nonprofit, so the Compassion Games, we're not planning to go public or be sold. But at the same time, I want it to grow and thrive, and I want to be able to provide creative ways to help people in local communities fund the work that they're doing so that they can make a choice and spend more time doing this. I, I think we really need, we need to rethink this whole issue about how um, we make and, and use our money. Well, I'll book That's you for another webinar. I'll book you on the secret economics yeah. webinar. And you started Good. answering you started answering my last slide of questions in bringing that up um, in terms of the economic system and how does that jive with the golden rule? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the golden rule: the men with the gold make the rules. It's <laughs> often. Uh, you know, said really in business, that's a kind of a catchphrase. It's kind of a way of dissing the idea of um, things like you know uh, kindness and that way of operating. It's winner take all, right? That's just not going to work. That doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And um, increasingly, consumers. I mean, seventy percent, at least seventy percent of the GDP is in our hands. We vote with our dollars. So for those businesses, like I love Paul Newman's Newman's own. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
the idea that they can make as much profit as they do and give it back, that's a powerful idea. And um, I know, you know, we want our products and services to be high quality. So if that's, you know, you have the choice between a high quality product and a high quality product that also gives back to the community, I make that choice all the time. And in that way, is try to send a signal to businesses that businesses need to be concerned not just with profit, but with people and the planet. And that triple bottom line, quadruple bottom line, we're hearing more and more about that. So I think businesses, you know, recognizing that they're a part of creating shared value in the communities in which they operate, and they should give back, and we should reward them for doing that. That's all part of, you know, what Rudolf Steiner called associative economics. And the idea that, you know, circulating and, and caring for each other and voting with our dollars. So this is this is bringing mindfulness to the marketplace, which I think is is key. Thank you so much, John. I couldn't agree more. Oh, thank you. Um, so I have put up on the screen a couple of website addresses, and um, first and foremost, absolutely sign the charter. We got some notifications during our webinar that some of our uh, participants did so, um, but also con connect to us on social media. Uh, because this is the the most uh, updated and uh, real time conversation we can continue uh, beyond today. And before we close, um, I'm going to start giving my closing statements. Uh, but please do raise your hand or send me a quick message if there's anything that you'd like to say. Um, I'm reachable at Molly at ParliamentOfReligions.org. Uh, but I want to let everyone know who's still on. Um, next week, we're having another webinar on the 23rd with Beth Lilac of the Holocaust Memorial Museum and Tolerance Center of uh, Nassau County in New York. Um, she's going to be speaking about cultural silence and how and why it fuels hate. Um, she's going to be talking a lot about the Holocaust, um, as that's where you know her expertise comes from. But these are lessons that are applicable to the day and age and the day we're living right now. Um, we see parallels in that. Uh, at the same time, um, I have to plug that we're running a campaign to create a $10,000 fund to sustain our Face Against Hate efforts this year on the crowdfunding site parliament.causevox.com. Uh, so I ask you to please con consider sharing something small or a uh, mega gift. Uh, last I looked, we were 25% to our goal, and we'd like to do that by the end of April. So we have a couple more weeks. Um, I want to say thank you again uh, to John Raymer. Uh, hopefully, this is the second of maybe a third webinar later in the year. Um, you know, if you guys all get involved and do this, it would be great to reconvene and, and be able to share, uh, especially as the Parliament ambassadors uh, who are not yet involved in the Parliament's uh, initiative now to partner. Um, start doing Compassionate Cities action in their neighborhoods. Um, and just figure out how we all get organized and work together best. Um, so I am so appreciative to that. And I asked John, do you have anything you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Yeah, I'd like to thank you, Molly. You in particular, not only the Council for a Parliament of World Religions, but what you bring to the work that you do and is an example of exactly what we're looking for. And I'm grateful to everybody who's on this call and for the work you're doing. We look forward to weaving our strategies together and finding new and creative ways to go from the golden rule to the golden reality. Superb. Um, and we have a thank you from one of our participants, Diana McDan McDaniel. Thank you, Diana. Uh, so we look forward to reconnecting. And uh, again, email me, molly at parliamentofreligions.org. Uh, I think John is john at compassiongames.org. Uh, oh, yeah. Very, re very receptive. And he'll talk to you while he's driving through at Starbucks at 930 at night if you have a great idea. So <laughs> we'll connect again soon. And again, keep in your hearts uh, the Kansas City community right now. Um, and uh, yeah. Send your thoughts and prayers, and uh, um, keep p keep us posted uh, if you have any ideas on how the Face Against Hate movement um, and the Compassion movement can be more responsive when horrible things like this happen. And, and let us just pray that we're not talking about another tragedy the next time we meet. So uh, have a great day, and we will share this on YouTube, so look out for that. Thank you so much. Goodbye.